Okay, now it's box comes up, says present your entire screen. Let's try that. And you should be able to select the screen. Is the PowerPoint presentation open? You should be able to select. PowerPoint presentation is not open. Yeah, you may want to open it first. This seemed very straightforward when we tried it out, but <laughs> we're getting lost here. Now we're seeing your screen with all your icons. Okay, now if we got all my icons, then we're then we can get there. <laughs> here we go. Opening the PowerPoint presentation. And we see PowerPoint opening. Come on, open up. So there we go. There's the presentation. There you so, go. Slideshow from the beginning. Now we got you. We're all, we're all seeing it now, right? Correct. Okay, let's begin. All right, slot antennas for ham radio. Some of you may have already seen this. It gets has been presented a number of times in different ways. I keep updating it, so you'll find some new things. I I'm sure tonight, even if you've seen it before, it was presented at the at the virtual expo uh, a few a few weeks ago, which seemed to go pretty well. Slot antennas for ham radio, a kind of a mystery topic, as we symbolized by this Star Trek slide from the undiscovered country, a Star Trek episode, and uh, because slot antennas though almost every ham has heard about them, are pretty much undiscovered country. By the way, that uh, QR code, code at the bottom is my email address if you want to grab it with your cell phone. It'll come up later. Slot antennas were, were known, but they were not commonly known by everybody until 1938, when this very British-looking engineer at EMI in England, Alan Bloomline, introduced the or reintroduced the slot slot antenna to the radio world when the television industry was in its infancy television needed a special kind of an antenna they needed a vertical which was omnidirectional yet they needed a vertical which was horizontally polarized and that a slot antenna can uniquely do that's what vaulted it into into popularity Here's the big tower on top of Twin Peaks in San Francisco called Mount Sutro, the famous TV tower. And you see three big slot antennas, which continue to be very common in, in television broadcasting. Many hams, many hams have heard about them, but like me, I didn't know much about them. I knew that they were used for microwaves. There's a compound slot microwave on the left, and on the right is the tail of the Concorde which I believe had a slot antenna or two for their VHF communications. But in 1938, when the slot first became known widely, hams were disinterested in it. Because first of all, hams were not on VHF at that time, not to any degree anyway, all on HF. So there was little interest in a VHF antenna particularly one for television. Part of the reason why they were disinterested, if you take the image that a lot of people hold of the slot antenna, and here it is, this is a classical slot image. If you made a 40 meter slot antenna with the classical image, this is what it would look like on top of your house. I can see why not many hams were particularly interested in making one of these. And in fact, uh, it's still been a stumbling block for a lot of people. This is an image of slot antennas as hams that we need to lose to a large degree anyway. It still works on VHF and above, but for HF, no way will this classical image work. I became interested in slots when I published this article back in 2016 in QSD. Driving down the street one day, I saw direct TV dish sitting up on somebody's roof. And I thought, gee, wouldn't it be great if I could 
hide my two meter antenna, my base station antenna at home in one of these TV dishes because nobody objects to TV dishes, even in my small mobile home park where, uh, where antennas are strictly forbidden. Everybody's got one of these. So if I could hide my antenna in there, but I thought, how could I do that? All that metal in that dish, and this is the dish on the back of my house to this day, all that metal in the dish would fight with my two meter antenna. Then I thought, wait a minute, get smart. Use the metal to your own advantage. Simply cut a slot antenna in the reflector of that dish. Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know that's your two meter base station antenna. And because a slot antenna that's horizontal, which this one mostly is, has drooped ends, is vertically polarized. That's exactly what you need for a base station antenna. Vertically polarized horizontal antenna. Here's the picture of it cut in the in the dish. Can I remember it's vertically polarized, even though it's got drooped ends there. Most of the action is occurring in, in the horizontal portion. But I didn't know how to make slots much. I made that one work by guessing by golly with my jigsaw and a lot of poking and prodding. But I wanted to know the design rules for making slots. I wanted to know what about the width of the slot? What about the height of the slot? What about the length? All of these things. I wanted the design rule. So here I am with a trusty MMJ259B antenna analyzer and some aluminum tape stuck to, stuck to a big piece of cardboard. And I made a lot of different ones on that piece of cardboard to test it. I needed to make a number of discoveries before I understood how a slot antenna works and how I could use it to make practical HF slot antennas. The first major discovery which I made on that piece of cardboard is that there are no major restrictions on how wide you make the slot. It can be narrow or it can be wide. And the metal plane that surrounds it, it can be wide or it can be narrow. This was a vital discovery. But if you look in the antenna handbooks, and here's a diagram out of one of the well-known antenna handbooks by Terman. Here's his picture of what a slot looks like. And he's right that the horizontal slot is vertically polarized. That little E arrow in the middle shows the polarization. And a vertical slot is horizontally polarized. These little arrow shows the polarization there, horizontal for the vertical slot. But he also gives these figures for the plane, three quarter wavelength by half a wavelength. And I thought if Terman, one of the radio experts in this world, says that's how big, what kind of a plane you need, that's what you should make it. Wrong. You can make that plane any width you want and get a good practical slot antenna. But the third major discovery, and this is the one that I see one of you had a slide up uh, <laughs> before we started this. To me, this was the was the big rattler. I really, I really uh, came to some major understanding when I finally understood this question. How can a hole, a slot, an opening, some free space in a piece of metal be an antenna? It just didn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make any sense to most people when you mention slot antennas because they're still holding on to that classical image of a slot, of a big metal sheet with a little thin slot in it. That's not the only form of the slot, but that's what many hams believe. Here's another diagram, which you'll find in many books, which to me is misleading, but it's there, still there. This is how they try to explain slots. They say that a slot antenna at the bottom and a dipole at the top of, with the slot and the dipole being the same shape and size, they're complements of each other. In other words, the slot acts much like the dipole at the top. And that is true. That's a truism. But it still, to me, did not explain how that hole at the bottom in that big piece of metal 
could be acting like a dipole. It just didn't make sense. You'll also find this principle in a lot of the technical books. Here's this very austere looking French physicist of the 19th century who made a principle, who stated a principle that a hole in a metal plate and a dipole reflect, refract an EM wave in the same way, except for the polarization. But that didn't explain anything to me either. So the radio handbooks that I looked at, including the ARRL handbook, did not explain to me how a hole can be an antenna. This diagram, which I developed myself, does explain it. Look at the antenna in the middle. What is it? A folded dipole. All hams know what a folded dipole is, but all hams don't know what a slot is. But look at that folded dipole. What is it? It's an open space with a metal ring around it or a metal conductor around it. Now look at the bottom antenna, a slot antenna. What is it? It's an open space with a metal conductor surrounding it. In fact, look at the top. There's a cubical quad loop. Many of you may have had cubical quads if you do HF. There's one of the loops of a cubical quad. What is it? It's an open space with a metal conductor surrounding it. All of those are the same antenna. So if you put anything in your toolkit tonight, put this principle, a slot antenna is a folded dipole. That's all it is. Then you can understand it. But you can also understand from this diagram why the polarization changes for a slot antenna. Slot antennas are shunt fed, as you see at the bottom. It's difficult to cut the slot to make it to feed it in series. So typically, slot antennas are shunt fed. They can be series fed, but they typically aren't. A folded dipole, however, is typically series fed. We normally make a break in the middle, in the middle of it. But look at the quad loop at the top. This is an eye opener. How do you? Ch what can you do to change the polarization of a quad loop? Well, if you want it to be horizontal. Feed it at the bottom in series. If you want it to be vertical, feed it at the side. The same is true for a folded dipole. If you want a folded dipole to be horizontally polarized, open, them, open it up in the middle. If you want it to be vertically polarized, even though it's a horizontal antenna, open it up at the end. This is why the slot is vertically polarized and physic if it's physically, uh, physically horizontal or turn it up the other way, as Alan Bloomlight did with the TV slot. And a vertical slot is horizontally polarized. So is a, vert so is a quad loop. So is a vertical folded dipole if you feed it at the end. They're all the same antenna. This was a big eye-opener to me. To show that you that it's true, here's a diagram of a slot antenna, a classical slot antenna, showing the currents in that antenna. You will notice that the hot current, where is it? It's not in the hole in the middle, it's in the current around the edge. But that's the same thing that takes place in a folded dipole. So it's the same thing that takes place in a slot. The slot transmits because of the current right at the edge of the opening. So a hole is not the antenna. The edge of the conductor around the hole is the antenna. Now it makes sense. All right, my fourth discovery about slots, and this is a biggie too. They all were to me, and they are if you want to use slot antennas practically. You, uh, can you bend the slot or the plane? Does it have to be straight? Does it have to be, does the metal that surrounds it have to be straight? Or can you bend any of those? Well, I already showed you that you can bend it on the satellite dish. So I already had a clue to this. Yes, you can bend the slot or the plane and still have a slot antenna and a good slot antenna. Here's my, here was my first antenna where I really bent up the slot. I staggered it. This is aluminum tape stuck to the patio door, my patio sliding glass door to my patio. Two inch wide aluminum tape that I bought at the dollar store. 
and I made a slot antenna out of it, but I staggered the slot. It's in the same plane, but it's staggered up and down. So the slot goes up and down, up and down. That's still a slot antenna. And notice the SWR marking there. That's the shunt feed. There's the feed line coming in through the ballon. So we shot to the shunt feed. And the tape at the other end is how you tune it. You just change the length. So here's a classical example that you indeed can bend or, as you'll see later, fold a slot antenna. And it still is a slot and it still works well. And it's still a folded dipole. Here's the most fun slot antenna I ever built. That's a Lincoln style hat made with real thin flashing aluminum that you can buy at any, at any hardware store. And notice the black on the top. That's a hole. That's a, that's a folded, staggered slot. It is a half wave, typical half wave slot antenna, shunt fed at the end, but staggered and folded or rolled into a cylinder. I've made lots of antennas on milk bottles and trash cans and so forth by knowing all of this. Um, there is, by the way, a metal shield inside of this, so when you put it on your head, it doesn't fry your brains. <laughs> when I wear this at swap meets and other things like that, it draws lots of attention. Here's another slot antenna. This one was published in uh, March uh, 2010. Um, as you'll see, the slot is that open space between those two metal planes. It's that the two aluminum bars at the side and the two metal planes, that's the plane. But notice that the metal plane of this slot is folded 90 degrees. It's, it's, it's an orthogonal plane. It's not a normal plane uh, as we ha would have it. But this is still a slot antenna. And notice over there at the right end of the right green arrow is the feed point. It's a shunt fed feed point coming in through one of the one of the bars at the edge, making this a vertically polarized slot antenna. This is a great antenna, by the way, if you if you're an RVer and you want to put a very low profile two meter antenna on top of your RV, this is perfect. It's only four inches tall. It's not going to get knocked off by all the passing trees. And it's ground independent because it is a full half wave slot. It doesn't need any ground plane or anything. So you can stick it on top of an, uh, an aluminum uh, skinned RV, or you can stick it on top of a plastic skinned RV. It doesn't make any difference. Works just fine. In fact, the metal skin RV makes it work a little better. Here it is on top of my pickup truck where it works, works fine, held on by four uh, magnets stuck into the roof. And I, I've tested this uh, at illegal speeds on the freeway. <laughs> Sticks up there just fine. Okay, now here's here's the discovery though, the fifth discovery that led to the slot antenna for the for HF practical slots. The plane or the metal conductor can be very narrow, and you can still have a good slot. I discovered this by by looking on the internet for slot antennas, and I came upon this fairly well-known slot antenna called a hantenna, which was created by three Japanese hams back uh, in the 1970s. Uh, it's a skeleton slot. Why do we call it a skeleton slot? Well, that's pretty obvious. The metal plane is just a skeleton around the edge, or if, you, if you'll have it, a folded dipole around the edge. And of course, it's, it's shunt fed like like slots are. This is the classical skeleton slot. You see it for six meters, you also see it for two meters. This is the six meter one, hence it's, it's a vertical uh, antenna, but it's horizontally polarized because of the direction of the feed there at the bottom. And uh, I discovered in with the antenna that, the, that, that making HF slots using this, using the skeleton slot, that a ratio of height to width of about three to one, which the antenna is, is about the right ratio for making an HF skeleton slot. Uh, as, a, as a side issue here, just to show you this one, here's a skeleton slot. Here's the antenna that's been folded. 
I ran this article in October, in January 2019 as the cube slot. As, as you can see, if you just unfold that, that cube and flatten it out, it's just a antenna. It's a folded skeleton slot. But we, I already knew you can fold slots, so why not? Here's a little 11-inch cube that has the same performance as a five-foot-tall, the famous copper J-pole for two meters. Which one is your neighbor going to notice? Here's, here's the best email I ever got back from a, from a reader. He's some other call sign by now. He was just super happy with his cube slot, a folded skeleton slot. If you don't believe it, it's good. Here the, here's the radiation pattern, uh, easy neck radiation pattern of a J-pole in red, the, fi the big five foot tall, famous copper J-pole that every ham makes, and a cube slot. You can see that they very equal performers. And again, which one on your roof is your neighbor going to notice or the HOA going to notice? Good bandwidth, too. Look at the bottom bandwidth there. Across the wider than the two-meter band, under two to one. In fact, somebody asked me now, can you make it for six meters? I always get asked this question whenever I, I write an article on a two-meter antenna. So I decided, well, can I make it for six meters? And I thought, sure, I can. Here it is. Let's start with a two-meter antenna, which is 103 inches uh, uh, long. And uh, there's a two-meter antenna, horizontal, so that it's vertically polarized. And if you fold it into a six-meter cube slot, it's now a cube 25 inches on the side. That's still pretty big for an antenna, particularly made out of copper pipe, pretty hard to mount and hold up on the roof. So I thought, all right, let's make it smaller. We'll make it smaller by staggering it as well as folding it, just like I did with that aluminum tape on glass antenna. Now I've got a little cube, 15 inches on a side, only 14% the side of that, of that antenna, which has pretty much the performance of your famous six meter J pole, which is about 11 feet long. Here are the two cube slots the two meter one and the six meter one. But notice on the six meter one on the right, the slot folds around the cube, but also staggers up and down around the cube. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And all it took was some extra bars to make it do that. The SWR is adjusted by sliding that one slider where the feed point hooks up and the tuning is done by uh, sliding the one on the other end uh, to give you the change the total length. Now, the last of the discoveries that makes it all come together, and this is an interesting principle. Stand up in your radio club when you get a chance, if you ever get to do it again, <laughs> or even here on by, by Google Meet, and ask the simple question, what part of an antenna radiates? And a lot of people will probably say, well, I, I guess since it's an antenna, all of it radiates. Well, to some degree, all of it does radiate, but not all part of its parts of it radiate equally. And this is an important principle. Here's a little proof of that. I'm a great lover of EasyNEC, the antenna modeling software. And if you wanna be an antenna designer, you should get used to NEC software. I happen to like Easy Neck. It's my favorite. There, A double R L has one, and there's several others. Four Neck Two is a good one. Here's an, an Easy Neck model, however, in the middle of the famous antenna on the left. Or I should call it the infamous antenna. Probably the most built, home-built ham antenna in history. Maybe short of Yaggies. The famous five-foot-tall copper pipe two-meter J pole. One of the nice features of EasyNet is that it'll show you what the currents are throughout your antenna. That's what those purple lines are. On your model, if you, if you turn the current display on, you will see the purple lines appear. And, you, and it shows you what the current strength and, and, and uh, phase are by the position and of the purple line. 
the farther the line is from the model, the stronger the current. So you can see there at the top, at the top, there's very little current. And at the bottom there's, uh, of the top section, there's very little current. But in the middle, uh, it's the radiation. But that's what a J-pole is. A J-pole is just a, a vertical dipole. The bottom section, but notice it, that's the important section. You can see the current and the phase. The phase is the direction the purple line is away from the model. And you can see what are they? They're equal and opposite, equal in amplitude, but opposite in phase. Okay, what happens when you have currents that are equal in amplitude and out of phase and near to each other? They cancel out. At least they cancel out in making RF or in transmitting. They still there, but they don't permit any transmitting. So here's the J-pole. It does not transmit off that bottom section. It only transmits off the top. And, and this is a very important principle. I, I examine all antennas that I make with this principle. And this is a very great use in making slots for HF. So let's put all these discoveries together and look at slots for the HF bands. We're going to look at, at my favorite one, which is I consider the best slot I've ever built. It's called the double inverted delta skeleton slot. I lectured on this at the virtual expo here recently. It is a vertical. And hams like verticals for many reasons. A low, low radiation angle, primarily. They have a low takeoff angle. But they have some disadvantages. But here is a vertical that is horizontally polarized. Why is that good? Aha, uh -huh, it gets rid of that bad noise that people hate in verticals. It also, but it's still, as a, as a vertical, it's still a low angle radiator. But because of the current cancellation, all of the radiation comes from the top of this antenna. And let, let's see that, let's see these first three and then we'll come to the fourth one in a minute here. Here's the model of this antenna. As you can see, it's a delta. It's still a skeleton slot, but it's a delta. The bottom has been narrowed so that the whole antenna is, a, is an inverted delta. Notice the currents and the phases of the currents from Easy Neck. You can see that in the bottom section of this antenna, as is true, mostly true of a antenna, or a, if this were, were a, a rectangular skeleton slot, most of the current in the bottom cancels out, cancels radiation. There is no radiation essentially from the bottom of this antenna. It all comes from the top where there is no opposition of current. It's all in one direction. And what direction is it in? Horizontal. This is a horizontally polarized, which is great for low noise, vertical antenna, which is great for low angle radiation. And it has one other benefit over most verticals. Oh, by the way, before we get there, um, here's, a, here's an example that I took off the internet just recently. Here's a common way people use delta loops with a tower. They put the delta up this way. Wrong. This is not the way to put a delta loop up against your tower. Why? Where's all the radiation coming from? From the bottom. He may as well, he may as well have nailed the dipole to his back garden fence than do this. If you want to put a delta up against your tower, you've got to put a cross arm up there and make the delta upside down. Delta loops should be, vertical delta loops should be mounted with the long side upward. They should be upside down if you want them to work well. Okay, back to the, back to the, these four benefits of this antenna. It, we already saw the first three, but now look at number four. What vertical do you know that has azimuth gain? Well, you, there aren't any. Verticals are usually omnidirectional in azimuth. How do you get gain out of them in azimuth if you want it? You put them up in a four square or something like that. You put four of them up and phase them so that they now have some directivity. This one antenna, this one vertical skeleton slot has azimuth gain 
almost equal to a small three element beam. Don't believe it? Yes, it does. Let me show it to you. Here's the actual, here are the easy neck plots of the gain of this, of, the, of a 30 foot tall double inverted delta skeleton slot. Um, this is one of the one loop of it uh, on the various bands, 10 meters through 20 meters. When it gets down to 80 meters, it still becomes pretty omnidirectional. But look at the gain on 10 meters. The outer ring, by the way, here is at 5 dBi. What's a, what's a dipole normally? 2.1 dBi. So this has got at least, uh, this, this has got 7 to 8 dB better gain than the vertical dipole. You, you can't beat this antenna for gain and low noise and high, high angle radiation. Here it is in my backyard. As you can see, I live in a small mobile home, and that's all the backyard I have. This antenna, which is a 30-foot version of it, uh, sits in a ground tube. It has no guy, no guy wires to hold it up. There's a three-foot three uh, ground tube, which I sunk into the ground. And by the way, you don't need any concrete to hold up a four-foot ground tube. The ground will hold it just fine. People almost always insist, though, on burying a ground tube in concrete. Don't bother. Uh, it has no guides. Because this one is, is not in a non-tuned version, you can make them in tuned versions too, uh, this one has a base auto tuner so that I can use it on all bands 80 through 10 meters, uh, even 6 meters for that matter. Uh, but it requires a, an expensive auto tuner at the base. Don't, you can't use the tuner in your shack because the coax loss will eat you alive if you do. You have to have an auto tuner at the base, a remote auto tuner. Unfortunately, they're getting difficult to buy. The manufacturers of auto tuners or uh, base remote auto tuners are not doing very well with them. So some of them are phasing them out. The LDG RT600 is the one I have I use for a long time. Uh, I don't. They're hard to get anymore. L, uh, uh, you know, MFJ still sells a one that works fine. You're there, I think you're presenting your screen. What's that? You're presenting your screen. Can you please stop presenting? You're presenting your screen. Will you stop presenting them? Do you want me to stop presenting? No, we had another member. Oh, another. Another. Okay. Okay. Are we clear and can we move on? Yes, we're seeing you now. You're no longer presenting. Okay. So can you see the top of this antenna? No, we're seeing you now. You're going to need to go back in and start presenting. Okay, I'll have to shut, shut this down. Oops. Okay, let's minimize this. Mm -hmm. How do we stop sharing this thing? Just click present now. You're not you're not presenting now. You just need to click present I don't now. See, I don't see the present now screen. I'm still seeing my screen. Yeah, you'll have to minimize your PowerPoint and so you can oh. see yourself again. Okay. I, I see John's presentation fine. You do see my presentation? Yeah, the, the, Jeff, this is Troy. Uh, so on the right-hand side, uh, I see John's camera as one presenter and I see his screen as another. And so I just pinned what looks like in the participant list, a participant named presentation, John Portune. And I pinned that presentation to my screen. I see him in the list of presenters. So I would say, John, don't make a change and viewers look in the list of presenters. So in the top right of your screen, you'll see a little icon of two people. If you click it, you'll see a list of presenters, all of our names. If you scroll down to the P's, there's a presenter named presenter, at least for me. Tell me if this is working for you, otherwise I'll stop sharing and bring it up again. I'm not seeing that presenter. Okay, let me, let me stop sharing and then we'll bring this presentation up again.
I don't think the problem is on the presenter's end. I think the problem is on the receiver's end. So don't stop what you're doing. I've been seeing it just fine. Okay, well, I, I stopped. And let's go back to present now. We'll pick it up that way. Oh, okay. Okay, where where is uh, okay, okay, share. Okay, here we go. Okay, I am I am presenting. Did you have your PowerPoint open before you did this? That's the problem. Nope. While we have this interlude, I'm gonna drop the link in for the door prize entry. So if you all are members and click that link, you can go to a form that will let you enter the door prize drawing. We were doing so well. <laughs> and I'll unmute. We're back again. OK, let's go to present now. Your entire screen. Sure. What do we do? I'm at a loss here, guys. Uh, what to do? Yeah, somehow, you know, we got to your screen with all your icons the last, when you did it successfully, and I'm not sure why. Are you sharing a window or sharing your screen when you go into present now? Since you were presenting to everyone. Yeah, and we're seeing your screen with that message and everybody else's video, but just, we're not seeing your screen with the icons. Just, just click the minimize, minimize at the top of the screen. This window. Don't exit. Just, yeah, just don't minimize. exit. Just minimize the minus button. There you go. Correct. Do it again. There we are. Your, and then start your PowerPoint. Oh, no. Okay, now let's start the PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay, now you should be seeing the top of the antenna. Yes. Okay, good. Well, this is the top of the double inverted delta skeleton slot antenna. This is a 30-footer in my backyard. You can make them any height you want, uh, frankly, as long as you keep the one three to one height to width ratio. Uh, but 30 foot seems to work extremely well, and it's 
and in my small mobile home, I don't want to go any any higher than this. They work they work somewhat better if you make them taller, but a thirty footer works remarkably well. Um, so uh, this is the top. You can see it's that's an aluminum pole made with with uh, telescoping or nesting sections, six foot sections of aluminum tubing uh, that taper from two inches up to one and one and five eighths at the top. And then there's a 3D printed block at the top, which you can, if you have a 3D printer or know somebody that does, you can, you can I'll send you the file, uh, or you can hand fabricate a, a center block. The spreader arms are fiberglass half inch fiberglass tubings. I'll give you a source for those here in a moment. Uh, and they're four feet long, which works well with a 30 foot, uh, with a 30 foot uh, or 25 to 30 foot uh, double inverted delta. The wires of the loop, which by the way, are 14 gauge standard house wire, insulated house wire, a stranded insulated house wire. Uh, they, they cross over, over a little loop at the top to the other side and then come down keep the loop separated so they don't arc at the top. Uh, here's what this antenna looks like. If you let the telescopic sections, again, they say there are six five foot telescopic sections that slide down into each other that are held, that are held up uh, with stainless holes clamp just to keep them from sliding down. And this thing telescopes up and down very easily. I'm 82 years old. I can get out in the backyard, put this thing up in 10 minutes. So it's no, it's no uh, difficulty. Easy to pack up. And here it is folded down completely uh, with the wire from the loops, uh, which go to that little block there in the in the middle of the mass there, uh, rolled up in a coil. In the middle of the screen at the bottom, you'll see the RT600 remote auto tuner, which I used for quite some time. And above that, a little 3D printed box, which can be a conduit box, is a, just a double pole, double throw relay, which I switch from the house. This allows me to change the, uh, reverse one of the loops. And what that does is it, re it, it rotates the directionality of this antenna. Remember, this is a directional vertical, uh, <laughs> unheard of term, a directional vertical. and but it has a nice broad beam. So a 90 degree rotation is sufficient to pretty much cover anything you want to. Here's where you get this tubing to make these antennas. I, usually local metal dealers don't carry thin wall uh, antenna mass tubing. But if you go to DX Engineering, they do. Or you can also go to Texas Towers. Uh, they're, they're another source of, uh, of this kind of tubing. Or Max Gain, M A X G A I N systems. They're the people that make the spider beam, which many of you may know of. Uh, they all sell. They all sell. All sell this thin aluminum, strong aluminum, thin walled aluminum antenna tubing. And I bought six nesting sections, six foot sections, tapering from one and three eighths to two inches, so I can make the whole thing telescopic. Make it one size if you want but then you got to put it up other by some other means. And I bought four half inch, four foot fiberglass spreaders. They also sell the spreaders. So does all those other sources, Max Gain and uh, Texas Towers. And five stainless hose clamps, which go above each section just to hold the section above it up when you want to put it up. Very easy, very easy to erect. So there's where you get the material to build one of these. Now, if you don't want to invest in one of the high cost auto tuners, and believe me, you don't have to, but you can't use a tuner in your shack. That's an absolute no, no, because that'll put a piece, a long piece of coax between your shack and this antenna. This antenna is a high impedance, non-resonant antenna. And when you get high impedance, uh, a non-resonant antenna, on the end of a piece of coax, you've got high SWR. Coax hates SWR. The losses become terrible. So what I do is I put a little, just a simple antenna tuner, 
a simple manual antenna tuner out there. Uh, uh, and here's one I built real simply with a roller inductor and a, a, a rotary capacitor. Or you can use a common antenna tuner, which a, a manual antenna tuner. Just put it in a box out at the base of the antenna. Put some marks on the front so you know where to put it for each band. Go out there and set the band. It's easy to do. It takes a few minutes, and you can change bands. The auto tuner is handy. It's convenient if you have to have it, but uh, it's expensive, and they're getting harder to get. So this is a perfectly, perfectly good way to uh, to run this antenna without an expensive auto tuner. And that's it, friends. That's what you do. That's the double inverted skeleton slot. Now, as they say on radio and television, let's pause for these important messages. So I'm going to give you here a shameless commercial for my the the uh, uh, and the Kindle book that I wrote. And Here's my little doggie to say goodbye to you. No, her call sign is not D0GGY. Her name is Lolly, as a matter of fact. And there's my e and there's my uh, my email address up there at the top, jportune at aol.com. Be glad to correspond with you or talk to you on the phone. Send me an email, and or we can set up a another meeting, uh, another one of these remote meetings, and just talk personally. Uh, these slot antennas are fantastic antennas now that we have the principles on how to run them and stop thinking about them as that big metal plane on the roof. And that's it, folks. That was great, John. Thank you very much. Do you want to take some questions, if there's any? Yeah. Let me get rid of my screen here. We're just seeing you now, Joe. You're seeing me now. Yep. Okay. Well, anyway, I don't. I don't need to see you. <laughs> um, sure. Any questions? Shoot. <laughs> you should have a tab there that says "Meet." Little is the there. We it. There we go. Again, pardon for my ignorance of the uh, Google Meet. I'll now be more familiar with it. <laughs> We've had quite a few of these guys built and uh, quite a lot of good reports, particularly because people like them at field day. They're so dang portable, you can scrunch it down, stick it in your RV, drive off with it, or take it out to field day. Hey, uh, John Brian Slaughter K zero WHU question for you on uh on uh, the antenna, so you're uh, mentioning auto tuner. MFJ uh, auto tuners work good on this. Sure. And how how long a coax you say from your transceiver out to that auto tuner should you limit yourself to? Thanks. From my transceiver to the MFJ auto tuner, if I use one, and I have used one on this antenna, uh, is 75 feet of LMR 400 or 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 uh, 213. Doesn't the coax doesn't matter as long as the tuner's at the antenna, and the tuner's not at the and not in your shack. And by all means, do not try to use the auto tuner in your rig. You'll blow it up. I've had a couple of people do that with this antenna, <laughs> and uh, to their to their chagrin. Uh, and again, the reason why this is why a lot of people think that auto the tuners have a lot of loss. No, they don't. They have some loss, yes, but not a lot of loss. The most of the loss, ham C, when they think their tuner's creating a lot of loss, is because they're running coax after it. It's the coax that's eating the power. If you take a look at the figures of what coax is with at a high SWR, very little power gets through coax with an SWR much above about three to one. So don't ever try to use coax after a tuner. It's a bad choice. Any other uh, questions for John? Yeah, I, I have one. On that uh, Delta antenna you just showed us, how far up that antenna is your feed point? From the feed, feed point is at the bottom. It's right at the bottom? Right at the bottom if you're running an auto tuner. If you want to... Okay. If you want to manually match it 
uh, and my little auto tune, my little manual tuner just connects, just connects to the, uh, uh, to the two wires of the loops. That's all. Uh, okay. You can make a completely manual, uh, a completely uh, self-contained tuner up there by narrowing the, the uh, deltas into a, a straight parallel line of a few feet long and then front feeding across it. Uh, that's uh, one way of doing it, but uh, I, I can't go into all the ways you can match such an antenna, but, but basically this antenna is just fed with, fed with some kind of a matching network uh, into, the, into, the, into the wires of the loop. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? AA0JK. Yeah, Fred. Yeah, I think uh, John mentioned a publication that he had. Could you uh, uh, give us a little bit more information on that where we might uh, obtain it? Sure. Go to Amazon.com and just search for slot antennas for ham radio. It'll come right up for you. It's in, Thank you very much. It's seventy three. It's inexpensive, four ninety five, and uh, and, uh, and quite a lot of them have been sold. <laughs> it's an ebook, right? It's an ebook. It's an ebook that you'll get there on uh, on uh, Amazon. Okay. Thank you very much. Seventy three. Sure. Okay. Anybody else before we uh, attempt to do our drawing? Top was Bob Messenbrink, NB0BN. Okay. ND, so Bob, you're the right. ND0. Bravo, Mike. No, November, Bravo, Zero, Bravo, Nor November. Bravo. NB0BN. Yeah, that's Are me. You? That's you. Okay, well, uh, we will. Snail mail you a uh, certificate. So congratulations as our uh, our first uh, winner. Uh, that's providing. I I don't know everybody, so it, providing you are a member, and I assume you are. So uh, uh, anyway, we will uh, get your address off the roster and and uh, mail you the uh, certificate. Like I say, the only thing we we're putting a six month tail on them just. So, you know, within six months, you need to, to use it. So, well, that went pretty smooth. And Bob, Bob, is your, Bob, is your email or your address good in the roster? Yeah, it's all correct. And uh, thank you, by the way. I appreciate it. And a real honor. Okay, well, good. You are our first. We, we just, uh, we, the board, thought that it would just be a good gesture. And we haven't been able to do anything, you know, ham fest wise or uh, anything like that. So, it's just something we can do to, uh, you know, add a little bit of something. So congratulations. We'll get it off to you. And uh, any other questions out there for uh, me or just general comments? Or if not, we'll... Uh, Bar Barbara has her hand up there. Get your hand. Okay. Okay. I can't. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. I, I just wanted to... Are, are you... Am I, am I up? I hear you, yes. Okay. Um, I was just wanting to confirm that we uh, recorded this uh, presentation. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Barb. Uh, good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. I, got my, um, I have my hand up. Okay, with your hand up. I don't see you, but go right ahead. Yeah, this is Bill W6OAV with an advertisement. Uh, next week, or next month, I should say, I'm going to do a presentation on stealth attic antennas that I have successfully used for like 35 years. And I plan to end the presentation with a video that John has made called Super Coil. John, do you want to make a little advertisement for your video that I'm going to play? Okay. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, the ARRL didn't want to publish that article, but a lot of people have, uh, have seen it. 
it's a, an interesting project taking one of those cardboard tubes that you can buy at most home improvement centers and uh, they're making pouring concrete posts and making a super duty loading coil out of it using copper tape around it and using it as a, an, a, a base for a, a hidden attic antenna. It's uh, It works very well. <laughs> Sonotube. Yeah, that's it. It's interesting. What's the material you use? Well, if you go to any home improvement store, you know, uh, big box home improvement stores, even some local hardware stores have it. These are cardboard tubes, big cardboard tubes. They come up in diameters up to 12 inches down to about eight inches, I think. And they're six feet long and they're heavy duty cardboard. And, uh, and that's, that's where they are. So, so if you they're used to pour uh, caissons for supporting structures. Yeah. They, they, they're used to for, to pour concrete into. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, to make posts with. Yeah, we don't want to ruin the video for uh, next month there, John, but you give a big yeah. preview of it, and it fits right in with my presentation on shortened attic antennas. Well, good. Be sure you send me a, an email reminding me of your presentation so, I, so I'll join you. <laughs> it sounds good, and I'd love to have your uh, comments after the video. Sure. Okay, well, great. Yeah, that'll, uh, that'll be good. Uh, so you get a little tease of what's going to happen uh, next next month. So uh, any final questions, comments before we shut her down? What was the final? I, I saw 62 at one point. How many do we get up to tonight? Did you notice her? Uh, I saw 64, I think, at one time. Great. It varied a little bit. So I see 54 right now. So uh, anyway, well, John, thank you very much. Very interesting. And do you have other uh, other things that you would uh, consider presenting at a later time? Oh, absolutely. Any of my, particularly any of my QST articles now, and I think the number is up to 23 or something like that, I'll be glad to do a presentation on if you saw one of those and would like to. Uh, but uh, the uh, one that uh, is uh, coming up and asked for fairly often it has to do with using using metal tape such as copper tape and aluminum tape as we do on that big loading coil uh, for making vertical shortened vertical dipoles i ran an article on that one where was it uh uh when did i you know a, a couple of months ago in qsd a little two meter short shorty made with tape that one's that one's a, a pretty interesting one because there's some good principles uh, of antenna design in it. And, uh, and other things. So go to my website, which is just my call sign, w6nbc.com, and look at the articles and other things that are there, the other presentations that are there. And if you like one of them, I'll be glad to come back and give it to you. And maybe next time we'll get Google Meet working better. <laughs> Okay, well, that'd be great. Uh, I'm sure Bill is taking note of all that, but he, Bill, W6OAV, does all our uh, program scheduling. So uh, you, you're, you're a great resource, and uh, thank you very much. Ask me anytime, or if you've got a topic that you just like to hear somebody talk about, chances are I know something about it and probably can put a presentation together for you. <laughs> and okay, Bill and Barbara both have their hands up, Bill and Jerry. Okay, I don't see the hands, but who who's up there? Go ahead, one of you. Bill pulled his. Barbara has a hand up. I don't know if she my call, somebody said, "What's your call sign?" My call sign is W six N B C. I I made my good friend who I worked at NBC for seven years and uh, and in Burbank, NBC Channel Four. And my best friend there, also a very arvid, act, active now, now a silent key, unfortunately, uh, was mad as heck at me when I got that call sign. I, I got it by getting, getting my application in on the vanities right on the very day when you had to get them in and mailed it to that particular P.O. box in Kansas City or wherever it was so that my, uh, so my application went in. I didn't get my first choice. I wanted, I wanted W6USA. 
but uh, some a, a Baptist college in Southern California got that one ahead of me. But uh, W6NBC has always been a good call sign. It's one that people recognize. <laughs> For sure. Was there another question? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the, the hands, uh, Jeff. I don't know. Was there another question? Bar Somebody Barbara has a hand up, but I don't know. I don't see the hands. Go ahead, Barbara. If you go into screen layout and click tiled, you'll see them. I've got it. Barbara, go ahead with your question. <laughs> Hudson Miller has his hand up. Hi, this is uh, Hudson, KE0FAN, and the question is in a in a more traditional slot antenna that's that's fabricated in a, in a sheet of metal. Yeah. Um, is it sensitive? Does it require um, you know space around it to work correctly, or could it be mounted just to the surface of a wall? Well, if you if you uh, bring it in as it is with any antenna. And remember, it is, it's analogous to a dipole. What happens if you bring a normal dipole against a wall? Is it going to work? Yes, it is going to work, but uh, you're probably going to have to shorten it some. So uh, with, a, with a slot, the, uh, if you put a dielectric, essentially, in the, in the slot and not just air, it's going to essentially, you're going to essentially need to shorten the slot a little or just move the, the matching bar down a little bit. Okay, I see now that I got the right screen. John McGill, you had a question? Yeah, we'll try it. I don't know if you can hear me or not. We hear we you. Do. Okay, thank you. This is for John. On your orthogonal uh, plane antenna, I missed the dimensions the uh, of that of those plates. Was it 18 by 18 or? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head now. Uh, let's see, when, when did that article run? Well, if you go to my website, w6nbc.com, you will find all my articles uh, in, in, in PDF form that you can download. And it's, uh, I, I would say it's, uh, there's, no, there's no formula for calculating it. I worked it out very pragmatically because the path the RF takes across that plane is complex. And so, uh, but uh, it's 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 a square of about sixteen to eighteen inches square, something like that. Okay, very good. That's uh, I've got the RV coming that uh, it's already eleven and a half feet high, and I really don't need much more on top of it before I scrape it off. <laughs> so that oh. looks like a good one to try. I was a very active RVer up until quite recently, and. Uh, I can't tell you how many antennas I've scraped off the top of it, <laughs> and this this one was this one is a a, a great performer for that. Has the gain of a J pole, and yet is only four inches high, and will go on a metal or a smooth skin RV, either one, just as well. Will it work okay without being metal, or, uh, like on a, a rubber over wood type of roof? Do you know? Because the slot inherently, the skeleton slot is inherently a half wave antenna. Uh, uh, not a quarter wave. It has it's ground independent, so you can put it on. You can put it uh, up a tree, or you can put it on top of a of a plastic smooth skin RV with just plywood underneath, or you can put it on a metal RV or on top of a car, uh, and, and it works pretty much the same because it's ground independent. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we had another Barb. I never did hear you, and I didn't see your hand. Did you have a question? Anybody else? I'm seeing nine. I'm seeing nine things at a time here. So, if you got a question, please. You can s slide that slider to the right on that tiles layout, and it'll give you more squares. Yeah, I'm. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm. Uh, let me try that. Or you need to get a 36-inch screen or something. Yeah, that's what I need. Um, okay, just a second here. Uh, change layout. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so we bring you it over here. You have your hand up also, Jerry. I do have my hand up. Well, 
I didn't intend on doing that, but lower my hand. How about that? Okay. Oh, now I see a bunch of. Okay. I, this is a. I'm kind of a Zoom guy too, so. Uh, this is a bit different. Okay. Uh, anybody else before we? I, Barb, I see you now. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Well, I think that probably puts to an end for our program. John, again, thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm sure uh, we will, Bill will be calling on you, I'm sure, to, uh, uh, we'll, we'll check out your, uh, we'll check out your website and we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, talking to you again. So uh, last call, hearing nothing. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, your attention. 73, everyone. 73. Thanks, John.